Today, I am reviewing and benchmarking the new AMD Radeon RX 7900 XTX and RX 7900 XT graphics cards, and I want to be very clear up front about the contents of this video. Due to the immutable forward progress of time, I had the option to cover one of these cards in more detail, or both of them in slightly less detail, and I have chosen the latter. So while you will be privy to my full slate of rasterization benchmarks across nine games at three resolutions, 4K, 1440, and 1080, as well as a 10 GPU lineup for comparison, Comparison, I will not be fully covering the extra stuff like ray tracing performance, fidelity FX, super resolution, content creation capabilities, or workstation tasks. I will put timestamps in the description though so you can jump to your favorite part. So let's see if the RX 7900 XT is worth it at 900 bucks or if the RX 7900 XTX is worth a thousand. Excellent! Today's video is brought to you by Kyoxia's ever-expanding family of high-performance SSDs, featuring their latest Bix 3D flash memory. The XG8 Client M.2 SSD is now available in capacities up to four terabytes, with up to seven gigabytes per second sequential read speeds. And for enterprise or hyperscale data center use, consider the CD8, which supports PCI Express 5.0, or the XD7P, which leverages the thermal and performance benefits of the E1.S form factor, ideal for pairing with the latest AMD Epic or Intel Xeon server hardware. For more on Kyoxia SSDs, click the sponsor link in the video description. All right, so my review is separated into three parts, and there are timestamps as mentioned. First, we have the performance of the hardware itself, clock speeds, temperatures, and power draw. Secondly, we have raw frame rate results from typical game rasterization benchmarks. And thirdly, we have a summary and conclusion. I'm comparing the RX 7900 XDX and RX 7900 XT to a stacked deck of the most powerful video cards in the world using the NVIDIA Founders Edition cards for Team Green wherever possible. We have the RTX 4090 and RTX 4080 from the 40 series, and the RTX 3090, RTX 3080 Ti, and RTX 3080. The RTX 3090 Ti is represented by the manufacturer overclocked MSI Supreme X, and from Team Red we have their former top GPUs, the RX 6950 XT represented by the Gigabyte Gaming OC 16G, and lastly the RX 6900 XT in AMD reference design trim. Now I already published a gratuitous unboxing video of these cards which I will link in the description, but here's another look and a refresher of the core specs. The XTX has a 355 watt TDP and the XT was bumped up to 315 watts from the originally announced spec of 300 watts, but power supply requirements did not change. AMD recommends an 850 watt power supply at minimum for the XTX and 800 watts for the XT. The cards both require two 8-pin PCI Express graphics power connectors, and for video outs, there's one HDMI 2.1 and two DisplayPort 2.1 connectors, not DisplayPort 1.4a, mind you, as well as a single USB Type-C plug meant for VR headsets that can also output a DisplayPort video signal via a sold separately adapter. The GPU itself uses the first ever MCM or multi-chip module design for consumers, featuring a single larger graphics compute die built on TSMC's 5 nanometer process, as well as much smaller MCDs or memory cache dies based on TSMC 6 nanometer for the Infinity Cache and memory controllers. The XTX uses 6 MCDs and the XT uses 5, with one dummy MCD filling the final spot for that GPU. Using smaller chiplets should allow AMD to achieve better yields in manufacturing so they can keep costs down, in theory. The remaining stats for the cards can be seen here, for the Radeon GPUs at least, and particularly when compared to the Radeon 6000 series, you can see big boosts in raw compute performance with up to 61 plus teraflops for the 7900 XTX, and significant increases in memory bandwidth, even with GDDR6 non-X VRAM, thanks to the 384-bit and 320-bit buses. Also note that AMD lowered the launch price of these cards versus last gen by about $100, which is contrasted heavily as we look at Nvidia's GPU stats where they were kind enough to tack on a $500 premium going from the RTX 3080 to the RTX 4080. Relevant stats for all the cards tested today are here if you want to pause to compare them, and I'm showing current pricing, which has gone up a lot for NVIDIA in the past month, based on the average of the cheapest two to three models available on PC Part Picker. Moving on to my test setup, all tests were run on this test system with an ASUS ROG X670E Crosshair Hero motherboard and a Ryzen 9 7950X 16 core CPU cooled by a Corsair 360mm AIO. Memory is a 32GB G-Skill Trident Z5 Neo DDR5 6000 CL30 kit, and for power we have a Corsair AX1600i 1600W ATX power supply. Tests were run on Windows 11 version 21H2, and here are stats for the rest of the system if you'd like to take a closer look. Let's move on to performance though, and here are the clock speeds I was 
we're seeing out of the cards while in use. The RX 7900 XT and XTX have game and boost clock specs listed by AMD, and as has become the standard, the cards boost well beyond the advertised clock speeds in practice, hitting 3,219 MHz peak for the XTX and 2,970 MHz for the XT. There was some rumored concern about clock speeds for these GPUs and whether they would get past 3 GHz, but as you can see here, we did surpass that, although I'd like to spend a bit more time with overclocking and frequency testing. Personally, who knows when I will have time to do that, maybe after CES. But here are my peak GPU core and memory temperatures, and there's several ways to interpret this data. First, for many ITX system builders, the XT and XTX are 2.5 slot GPUs that maintained reasonable temperatures, with core temps only in the high 60s to low 70s. The 4080, 4090, and 6950 XT are in the same range, albeit with lower VRAM temps, but remember that my 6950 XT is an aftermarket card with a large cooler, and the NVIDIA 40 series FE cards use very large cooling solutions as well. The VRAM temps for the RX 7900s could be a bit better, but overall AMD succeeded in making some visually appealing and quite capable coolers to keep the thermals in check. Let's round this part out with my power draw numbers, and here's another good result for AMD. These GPUs are not power hogs. 466 watts average system power draw for the 7900 XT under load, and 521 for the 7900 XTX is not the lowest on this chart, but it's only a modest 10 to 20 watt bump over the 6000 series, while also achieving much better performance as you'll see in just a moment. The 7900 XT was very close to the RTX 4080 in terms of peak and average draw, and thankfully none of these cards got up to 3090 Ti territory. And now it is time for traditional rasterization benchmarks at 4K, 1440, and 1080. Let's dive in. 3 d Mark Time Spy Extreme is first, which is a 4K test, and a graphic score of 14,336 gives the $1,000 RX 7900 XTX the edge over the $1,200 RTX 4080. The XT hit 12,437, a decent step back from the XTX, but still enough to beat the 3090 Ti. Please note that these 3 d Mark tests are synthetic benchmarks, so they are not included in my overall benchmark results. 3 d Mark Port Royal is next, so we can get a general idea of how these cards handle ray tracing. Formerly, Radeon GPUs kind of sucked at ray tracing, and while these Port Royal results won't necessarily carry over in a linear fashion to every game with ray tracing support, since there are many ways the technology can be implemented, it is nice to see such a big jump from the 6900 XT and 6950 XT. Specifically, the 7900 XT was 32% faster than the 6950 XT here, and the XTX was 55% faster. Moving on to real world games, we have a lot of DirectX 12 titles, starting with Far Cry 6, where at 4K the XT and XTX slot into the spots we somewhat expected them to based on rumors, with the XTX beating the 4080 and the XT coming up just short of it, hitting 102.2 FPS on average, which is about 7% behind, although it still surpassed the 3090 Ti. Whenever the 7900 XT is in the same ballpark as the 4080 or the 3090 Ti though, remind yourself that at 900 bucks it costs at least 25% less than those more pricey NVIDIA offerings. At 1440, we begin to hit CPU limitations, but here's another trend that we'll see continue to play out. The 4080 and 4090 are tough to beat at 4K, but at lower resolutions, the Radeon XT and XTX cards make a bit of a comeback. Here, they're 3.5 and 9% ahead of the 4090 respectively. At 1080p, we are pretty much entirely CPU bound as you can see, but the new GPUs from AMD still managed a 9 and 10% uplift versus the 4090. Next, we have Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and at 4K, we are looking more directly at the performance of each card, whereas at 1440 and 1080, CPU limitations begin to even things out. 163 FPS on average for the RX 7900 XTX is pretty much neck and neck with the RTX 4080, while the 7900 XT is about 14% slower at 138.6 FPS. At 1440, both Radeon cards jumped up in the charts again, with the 7900 XTX beating the 4090 by 4.2%. 4 the 7900 XT was also able to surpass the RTX 4080 by a modest 5.5% margin, although all the top cards suffered from slightly reduced 1% lows versus the rest of the pack. At 1080p, we are CPU bound again, and in this test, all the Radeon cards managed to surpass the competition by 20 to 40 frames per second. Cyberpunk 2077 is running with the Ultra Graphics preset, which presented the 7900s with a challenge. This is one of the poorer performing titles for Team Red, unfortunately, and while there are big improvements over the Radeon 6000 series cards, Nvidia still maintains a significant lead, particularly if you're factoring 1% low performance into the equation. At 1440, the 7900s claw back some performance, slotting in above and below the RTX 4080 on average, but the 1% lows were quite spotty and led to some noticeable hiccups while testing. 
And at 1080p, we are hitting CPU limitations again with those 1% lows hampering the XT and XTX's overall performance. Hopefully a driver update can smooth those out in the future. Here's Horizon Zero Dawn using the favorite quality preset. And this is another title where the 4080 and 4090 shine at 4K. The 7900 XTX couldn't beat out the 4080 here and was 2% behind, while the 7900 XT was slower by about 17%. The lead was reduced, but still maintained at 1440p, with the 4080's 218 FPS being 0.8% in front of the 7900 XTX and about 12% ahead of the 7900 XT. At 1080, the 7900's do that thing they do where they edge out the other cards in CPU limited scenarios, taking the number one and two spots by between two and 10 frames per second. Continuing on to Dirt 5, a soiled and filthy racing game where running the ultra high preset at 4K got us 152 FPS out of the RX 7900 XTX, another 11% victory versus the 4080 that also puts it 21% slower than the 4090. The XT was very close to the 4080 again as well. At 1440, the RTX 4080 is now much closer to the XTX, while also staying 9% ahead of the 7900 XT. The 4090 takes an even bigger lead though, hitting 287.5 FPS, which puts the XTX 23% behind. And at 1080, the margins shrink a bit, but not too much. The 7900 XTX maintains less than a one frame lead over the RTX 4080, while the 7900 XT is about 10% behind. Next up is Resident Evil Village, another DirectX 12 game, which is just generally spooky. The 7900 XTX pushed out 181 FPS at 4K for another 12% win over the 4080, while staying 18% behind the 4090. Radeon GPUs are typically competitive with NVIDIA in this game, and at 1440, they keep their position in the rankings without giving up too much ground. And even here at 1080, the Radeon 7900 XT manages to beat out the RTX 4080 to take the three spot, while the XTX nestles in just 3.5 frames behind the 4090 on average. Doom Eternal is my only Vulcan title, and it features squishy demons and extremely high frame rates. Starting at 4K, we see the 7900s struggling a bit, again with less than optimal 1% lows and results that drop them below the 4080 and 3090 Ti respectively. This is again a continuation of the RX 6000 series' performance, which while improved, leaves a lot to be desired. Let's see if things improve at 1440. And they do, with the XT at 400 FPS and the XTX passing 450. The RTX 4080 gets up to just shy of 500 frames per second here though, maintaining a healthy lead, but this is also a good spot to note that the RTX 4080's DisplayPort 1.4a output tops out at 240 Hz at 1440p, while the DP 2.1 connector on the 7900 XT and XTX can push 1440p at 480 Hz. And while those monitors might not exist yet, it's good to know that when they do, these new Radeon cards will be ready for them. And then at 1080, we see a mostly full recovery here for Team Red with the XTX at 585 frames per second and the XT at 536 back in their number two and four spots on the board with 1% lows in acceptable ranges as well. Lastly, we have a couple DirectX 11 titles. Here is God of War, where I would like to highlight a flip floppy shift in those aforementioned 1% lows. Here, AMD clearly has an edge in maintaining a smooth frame rate with both 7,900 cards leading the pack in that metric. Averages keep the XTX and XT in their number two and four spots though, but the trend continues at 1440, where more ground is gained by AMD, both on average and with the 1% lows. The XTX is 8% slower than the 4090 here, and the XT is about 6% behind the 4080. At 1080p, the XT surpasses the 4080 by about two frames, and the XTX is only about 10 frames behind the 4090, while both cards again keep stutters and hiccups to a minimum with much improved 1% lows. Lastly, we have Microsoft Flight Simulator running in DirectX 11 mode and exhibiting some of the worst CPU bottlenecking in my tests, although it is, of course, least noticeable at 4K. This game is a bit of a route for AMD with the 7900 XT hanging out down the list with the 3080 Ti and 3090, and the 7900 XTX coming in 16% behind the 4080 and almost 25% slower than the 4090. This is also a feature title for Nvidia's DLSS frame generation, which as shown in my RTX 4080 review, can get you significantly higher frame rates, particularly in a CPU limited title like this one. So MS Flight Sim enthusiasts will likely lean towards Nvidia's cards, but let's finish out our results. At 1440, we hit that CPU wall and suddenly none of the cards can get more than 80 FPS. Even the 40 series cards struggle here. This results in a bit of a comeback for Team Red and some decent 1% low results as well. 
and then at 1080p, the whole ranking system is upended and the Radeon RX 6950 and 6900 XT pull up to take a win, which just goes to show how higher resolutions like 4K and also games that are not CPU limited do a better job of showing the actual performance differences between the GPUs. But if I left this out of my spreadsheet, I would have a whole blank column that would just drive me crazy. Okay, it's time for my overall cumulative results. For those of you who were able to solve the secret riddle that I shared while I went over the individual benchmarks, leave the answer in the comment section below for free candy. I have evenly weighted my benchmark scores by game and I'm using the fastest 6000 series card, the RX 6950 XT, as the 100% baseline to see how far AMD has come with their new GPUs. Please note that these are sorted by the 4K results where GPU performance can be taken pure without the base alloy of CPU limitations but while the RTX 4080 does seem to edge out the RX 7900 XTX here, please note that the 1440 and 1080 performance differs, and by those results, the XTX is a bit faster than the 4080, 15.4 and 27.9% ahead of the 6950 XT versus 7.5 and 22.9% for the RTX 4080. Likewise, the 7900 XT outperforms the 3090 Ti at those lower resolutions while also getting edged out by less than 1% at 4K. But then we look at current pricing for these cards and things look much uglier for Nvidia, at least if you're a consumer who is at all concerned with value. Nvidia's competition for these cards by price in the $900 to $1,000 range right now is the RTX 3080 Ti, which is $975 for the cheapest version as of the filming of this video. Most were going for well over $1,000 and that card offers something like 15 to 40% less performance versus the 7900 XT or 7900 XTX. The rest of Nvidia's cards, RTX 3090 and up, are 20 to 60% more expensive, and to even see significant gains versus these cards, you'd have to opt for the RTX 4090, which starts at 1600 bucks and is also pretty tough to find in stock right now. Most are going for 1800 to 2000 or more. Of course, AMD might be dealing with their own stock issues for these cards in the coming days. It's still too early for me to tell with this review that was filmed prior to the for sale date, which is December 13th. But let me conclude. As I stated in my unboxing video, I think there's one company that has done a truly stellar job of marketing AMD's new $900 and $1,000 graphics cards to us, and that's NVIDIA by keeping not just a solitary Titan class or 90 Ti branded GPU in that Halo pricing tier at $1,000 to $2,000, but what seems like half of the NVIDIA product stack going all the way down to the 3080 Ti costing that much, NVIDIA seems committed to anchoring the value of their GPUs in a price range that many gamers simply can't afford. And that allows AMD to come along and say, hey guys, check out our $1,000 graphics cards. They are a better value than the competition. And they're right, at least for gamers who don't primarily play Flight Simulator, but these remain very expensive GPUs and we shouldn't forget that just because they're not $1,200 or $2,000. On the plus side though, performance for the RX 7900 XT and XTX was great almost across the board. The coolers performed well while looking quite nice to boot and power draw was within reason for GPUs of this caliber. Now, I'm just hoping that AMD's chiplet manufacturing techniques combined with their track record of actually reducing the prices of their GPUs over time will lead to some eventual fire sales on these cards, kind of like we've had with the 69 900 XT and 6950 XT in the past few months. The mid-range needs more powerful and affordable GPUs that don't cost as much as most gamers' entire systems. But there it is. Hopefully you guys now have a much better idea of how the Radeon RX 7900 XT and RX 7900 XTX graphics cards stack up. And I do think AMD will find a lot of interested buyers for these cards if they can keep them in stock and avoid ridiculously overpriced AIB partner cards. That's all for this review though. Closing reminder to check out my store at paulshardware.net for merchandise, shirts, pint glasses, and other thumbscrew related items. My holiday sale is going on through the rest of the year. And of course, hit that like button if you enjoyed this video and subscribe to my channel if you really enjoyed it. Thanks as always for watching guys, and we'll see you in the next video.